Welcome to the house of the Lord. I'm Pastor David Rose now. I thank God for this opportunity to be together with you in God's word. Thank you so much for all who subscribe to this channel. I only need 112 more to get over the threshold, then I can turn off the advertising. So if you haven't yet, would you please click subscribe? God bless our time together. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We've come into the presence of God, who created us to love and serve him as his dear children. But we have disobeyed him, and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him, and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you, and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus, my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. I'll offer the prayer of the day. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith, hope, and love, and that we may obtain what you promise, make us love what you command. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The word of God that is the foundation of our message today is recorded in Matthew chapter 16. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. The word of our God. I'll add a short prayer for the Lord to help focus our thoughts and our attention on the good he has in mind for us in this word. Lord, open now my heart to hear, and through your word to me draw near. Let me, your word, heir pure retain. Let me, your child and heir, remain. Amen. When I moved to Minnesota to start the eight-year program of study to become a pastor, I bought a house next to what would become one of our most treasured neighbors. A few months later, I moved my family to be with me in Minnesota, and I couldn't wait to introduce my wife to her. I said, this is Adeline. My wife said, Adeline. That's a beautiful name. And Adeline said, well, I haven't liked it for 93 years. <laughs> but that's what my father called me, so there's not much I can do about it. I said, your father must have loved you very much because that's a beautiful name. Asking someone, what is your name can be an entirely different question than who are you? When Jesus and his disciples were in the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was in the right place and he knew this was the right time to ask them, who am I? And it certainly wasn't because he didn't know. Caesarea Philippi was an interesting mix of many different religions, many that were far different and far from the worship of the one and only true God, the God of Israel. But even the Jews and the Gentiles, both the Jews and the Gentiles, 
knew to be watching for a Messiah who was to come into the world. But it was vitally important at this time in Jesus' ministry to know that his disciples not only knew what his name was, but to know who he really was before he would send them out to the rest of the world to tell them. So he asked them, who do the people say I am? They said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. By this time, King Herod had already killed John the Baptist. Were some people wondering, like King Herod did, if Jesus might be John the Baptist who had come back to life? Some wondered if he might be Elijah, the great prophet of the Old Testament. Well, Elijah never died. God's word tells us that God took Elijah home to heaven in a whirlwind and a chariot of fire. And what's more is that the scriptures also said that God would send, them a, send Elijah ahead of the Messiah to prepare people to welcome the Messiah, the Christ. But Jesus had already told people that John the Baptist was the Elijah that the Bible was talking about. Others thought Jesus might be Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jeremiah had boldly confronted the false prophets and the religious leaders who were leading God's people astray more than 600 years earlier. By mentioning these prophets, obviously the people thought very highly of who Jesus was. But they didn't think high enough. And if some of the people thought that Jesus was the Messiah, they had the wrong kind of Messiah in mind. The people were hoping for a Messiah who would help them drive out the Romans from their land and bring back their city like stories that they had heard from a thousand years ago in the Old Testament during the reign of King David and King Solomon. But like Jesus would later tell Pilate when he was standing before him, my kingdom is not of this world. Jesus didn't need to come to earth to defeat any earthly army. With a breath from heaven, he could have wiped them all out. No, Jesus had come to earth for a far greater battle, to battle against sin for us, to battle against death, to battle against the devil. That's why he became human. That's why he was on earth. And that's why he asked his disciples, what about you? Who do you say I am? Simon answered for all the disciples, he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. This is a great reminder for me. My life and my heart's desire is to tell people who Jesus is. Jesus is the Lord. Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is the Son of God and true God. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus is my Savior. But not everyone I tell believes that he is. But no human convinced Peter either. God did. Jesus, Father in heaven, did. Up until this moment, Peter's name had never been Peter. Peter's name was Simon. But giving us and all the world a picture to remember this rock-solid truth, Jesus used the Greek word for rock, Petros, and gave Simon the new name Peter. And not upon Peter, but upon his confession of the unchanging truth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, Jesus would build his church. Petros, Peter, the rock. What a strong name. What a strong picture. And that's another great reminder for me. Why? Because I know that at some times in his life, 
Peter was anything but a rock. Peter was anything but unshakable. Yes, we know he had moments of great faith, like the time he walked out on water in the middle of the night to meet Jesus. But the Bible also tells us about that dreadful night in a courtyard, the night that Jesus was betrayed and arrested. Peter was standing out in that courtyard next to a fire to stay warm. And it was with servant girls, not with scary soldiers, but servant girls, that Peter denied he ever knew Jesus three times. I could only wish that my record would show that I have ever acted or sounded like I never knew Jesus only three times. Maybe your record hasn't been perfect either. The Lord didn't have to ask his disciples what they were thinking. He knew them. He knew their thoughts. He knows us. He knows our thoughts. He knows our hearts. He knows our fears. He knows our failures. Every one of them. That's why we thank God that the church was not founded upon Peter. Then that it was not founded upon us. You and I have not come to know and believe that Jesus is the Messiah and our Savior by our own thinking or choosing or by our own reasoning or deciding or by figuring it out. God the Father revealed this life-changing truth to us the day that he created faith in our hearts to believe it. Only by that faith can we believe in our hearts and confess with our mouths that God is the Father, maker of heaven and earth, that Jesus, his only Son, is our Lord, that he was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. That doesn't make any sense, but he was. And what else doesn't make any sense at all is that for people like you and me who have thought, who have done, who have said the things that we have, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, and died to pay for all our sins. Thank God, three days later, he rose to life again and 40 days later ascended back into heaven to take his rightful place of authority over all things in heaven and on earth and under the earth and to await the time he already knows that he will return in glory to judge the living and the dead. That's how Jesus established his kingdom. And that's why he said the gates of hell will never overpower his church. The devil cannot undo Jesus' death. The devil cannot undo Jesus' resurrection. Jesus wiped away all the shame, all the guilt, all the stain of all our sins. And no matter how much he would like to have us think otherwise sometimes, the devil cannot undo that either. No government, no power, no evil, no fear, no conspiracy, no power, not even the gates of hell will overcome what Jesus has established. They will not overpower his children. They will not overpower his church. And they will not overpower our faith because of who our faith is in. Now, all the while, the devil and his evil forces will blow and beat upon it. He will work tirelessly to frustrate friendships. He will do anything he can to frustrate marriages. He will try to turn every good thing there is in this world into evil. And it looks so often in our lives, in our families, in our country, and in our world, like he is having a field day. But this word of God reminds us that he will never overpower Christ's church. That means he cannot overpower us. 
because in his amazing grace, Jesus calls us, his church. If all we ever knew about our neighbor was her name, we would have only known she was Adeline. But because we were also blessed to know who she was, we knew that she was the precious and only child of a humble, hardworking couple in the heartland of America, Minnesota. <laughs> she was only 10 years old when she was walking down a gravel road and hit by a car. She was not expected to live. A doctor performed rudimentary surgery for that time in her own home. And when he left their house, he said that he could only leave her in God's care. And now she was in God's hands. She and her husband never had any children, but they were content to work quietly on the farm. And then one day they sold the farm and they made the unthinkable move into a small house in town. And that year, on the day of their 50th anniversary, her husband died. She'd been alone for more than 20 years without any family. She'd sit in her front room and turn the dial on a kitchen timer just past 30 minutes, and then she'd sit looking out the window until it went off, and then she'd set it again. And even though she told me that the backyard was not a very smart place for me to dig up and plant my garden, <laughs> she set a chair at her back door. And she set another chair at the window in her back bathroom so that she could look out for hours a day and count how many flowers there were. And then she'd crack open the door and tell me when I came home. Each day I would tell her, that's great, because I planted those for you. And truth is, I did. And we would thank God for his goodness to both of us in the beauty that we saw coming into that garden. Because though some things had been shaky every now and then in both of our lives, by the grace of God, by the gift of faith, we knew and we thank God that our faith was built on Christ. And we knew that our Heavenly Father must have loved us both very much because he gave each one of us a beautiful new name when he called us his own dear child, Christian. This, this is the purpose of the church to tell the world one by one that Jesus is the Christ. It won't be us that convinces anyone. Like Peter, it will be God who creates the gift of faith to believe in him so that he can give them a new name and so that he can give them a new and glorious home with him in heaven. Dear Christian, the church is built on Christ. That means you are built on Christ. His church and all who are in it will stand forever. So that means until we see him or until he returns, maybe we can tell just one more. Amen. I'm going to share a very short prayer that I've written for today and then I'm going to invite you to please join together with me. We'll pray the Lord's Prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son to be the rock-solid foundation of our faith and of the church. Please grant us opportunity to share who Jesus is with one more so that they too might be given a new name and a new home with you in heaven. Lord, thank you for sparing so many of us down here in this region of the country from this last hurricane. And we pray that you be with all of those who have been hit and devastated in loss of life or property by this storm 
and goodness by many other storms that have gone across our country and across the world. Use this in some way, dear Lord, in a way that only you can to turn the hearts of more people to you. Please guide all those who are in positions of leadership so that they might work for the common good of all. Please be with all of those who are serving in our United States military and everyone who's working in public health and safety to keep us safe and free. For all these things and for so many more, we ask in Jesus' name who's taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Thank you for sharing your time. God bless you through his word. And I pray that God works through you, through me, through his word, to share this good news with one more. Lord willing, I'll see you real soon.